right, good morning, everyone. It's uh, Tom Roofers here, so we're going to get started. We'll try to get 7 a.m. Out. December 12th, 2018. We'll call this meeting of the Fergus Falls City Council Committee the whole uh, order. Roll call, please. Rachel. Roofers. Here. Thompson. Here. Armstead. Here. 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 We have a quorum. The uh, first item on the agenda is a discussion of the Charter Commission report. We have good representation this morning from the Charter Commission. Good to see you all here. And we'll call on uh, Sparky Hovland to give us that report. Good morning, Sparky. Good morning. Thank you, Your Honor and Council Members. See, well, can we just see who they are? I don't know the Charter Commission. Can yes, they just sir. raise their hands? Or? Charter. I'm not going to go through and announce everybody, but no. Thanks. <laughs> More coming. David here too. Um, the Charter Commission has been looking over the Charter for the last uh, year. It started in the fall of 2017. Uh, last time it was completely reviewed was 2012, so it has been a while. Uh, so the Charter Committee met numerous times throughout the year and did a complete uh, review of the whole document. And what we have today is our presentation to you on what our findings were about the charter. Uh, you were emailed a copy of kind of our, our working draft, red line copy, and some of it had uh, notes on the last few pages. Apologize for that. We had switches in secretaries and the document didn't get fully updated. So um, the city attorney did draft an ordinance which you have on your, uh, on your desk, and that's what we'll work off of today and go through what we found. Now, I'm not going to read this word for word because we'll, we'll be here all day, um, but in the red is, is our proposed changes to the charter. Um, Your Honor, I, I just feel we'll just go through this very quickly. A lot of it's just a little bit of wordsmithing, a little bit of punctuation changes. Um, we did not really change a whole lot of the, the meaning of the charter. Uh, in depth. We try to clarify a lot of spots that would make it easier, make it a better working document. Uh, so with that, um, Your Honor, if you want me to proceed? Or? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go by the dark section uh, sections, <coughs> highlighted word usage. On uh, section 1.06, uh, we just clarified that registered voters means voters that are registered within the city limits. So it's not registered voters within Minnesota, it's within the city limits. Uh, section 4.01, um, as far as uh, council meetings and how a new elected member uh, can start his position in the council, his or her position in the council, uh, we put in there after being qualified and sworn in at the first regular meeting of the council. And qualified uh, is to mean that all your election paperwork and document is, is completed and that you're sworn in, then you can start your duties as a council member. Okay? Just let me know if you want me to. If anyone has any questions, just feel free to, to jump in at any time. But other than that, Sparky, you just keep going and, and the council just feel free to um, okay. ask questions. Section 5.01, regular city council election. All we did was change a couple of capital letters, uh, the C and M on, on council member. Uh, section 5.03, um, special elections. Uh, we deleted the term as closely as possible because with the election laws, it's we're saying that we shall hold a special election but not closely as possible to the election rule. So we, we deleted that line. Section, uh, if I put my glasses on, no. Section 5.04, election notice. Uh, we deleted the line, failure to give such notice shall not invalidate the election. The same thing again, that we're asking the city minister shall put out a notice, and yet we're saying um, the failure does not give, uh, invalidate the election. So we deleted that line with uh, keeping with the current election laws. Section 6.01. This is one that we uh, add a little bit of change to, but uh, just for, uh, we add an S behind powers because it's, it's not just the power, it's powers. There's three powers that the uh, people are reserved. And um, 
the we added rezoning of land and with uh, the people can initiate and adopt any ordinance except for when it's appropriating money or um, authorizing levy of taxes and when we felt with the input that we had from our attorneys said that rezoning of land uh, we should add that in there and I guess I'll stop for any questions there or what was, I mean, what initiated the rezoning? I mean, I, I, it's kind of one of the last things I would think okay. you would come up with. I'm gonna, but it's the exception yeah. of the rezoning, correct? So we yeah. yeah. can't, we that can't initiate rezoning. That, that basically means that you cannot initiate, the, the citizens cannot initiate uh, an ordinance to rezone uh, land that's already been zoned. Could you imagine the situation where you bought your house in Reliance that it is going to be R1, residential district. And let's just say in your backyard it was R1 as well. Uh, but a group of citizens said, you know what, we want to turn that into industrial. So what we've, what the Charter Commission has done is just basically say, is zoning is important enough that we should uh, be able to uh, have a, a, an initiative process to rezone land when citizens have bought their property in reliance upon the zoning laws that they wouldn't change uh, without some type of process or a citizen's process through initiative. So um, this is a common uh, inclusion for uh, uh, restricting the ability to uh, provide the initiative process in other municipalities as well. And so uh, when they were, they were reviewing this section, uh, the recommendation is basically to give that some consideration. The Charter Commission believes that it's important enough that it should be included, that that is something that you cannot uh, subject the initiative process to rezone land uh, based upon the fact that citizens have purchased their land <laughs> in reliance that, you know, it's going to be zoned a certain way. Thank you. <coughs> okay, and then we add some semicolons just to make the wording uh, flow a little better. Okay, section 60.04, uh, we just added five, and we, we did that quite a bit. We had some where the numeral five and some where it was five was written out, and we made them both five and, and the numeral, uh, the word and the numeral together, so you'll see that quite a few spaces here. Section uh, 6.05, uh, same thing, we add the five wording, and then also, we had the form there, and we only had three lines, and we're asking for five names, so we added a couple more lines there. Moving down to six, section six point. So just, just on that one. Yes, Mark, please. The, so you've got five here, and then you've only got three here, so is there somewhere where it calls for three? Okay, I, I caught that too, but actually uh, one, two, three, and it can go down to infinity. That's where you get all your petitioners to sign. Right. So we're asking for those five committee members to put their names up and then just how we, we want their petitioners to, to follow along. So. Okay, it's 6.06. Uh, the filing of petitions and action there thereon. Uh, we took the line when the petition is found to be sufficient, the city administrator shall so certify to the council at its next meeting. That has just been moved up from section 607. Uh, we felt that um, dealing with 606, it kind of brought the closure to the end there. So it's just the moving that line up. And then 607 um, looks like a lot of changes, um, but what we did was, then again, we, we uh, looked to our attorneys and they did some review of election laws. So this wording is trying to uh, conform with election laws and make it simpler instead of having this uh, 70 days, 30 days, and, and so forth. We could go through and read this, but I don't know if anybody has any questions. So. Okay. <coughs> Moving on to uh, 6.11. Uh, referent petitions again we added the word five <coughs> again and and uh, now we already had five lines there so we're good 6.16 recall election uh, we're conforming with our election laws so we deleted uh, quite a few of the 
tail end there, but then mm -hmm. schedule a special election on the petition on the earliest date permitted under Minnesota state law. So there again, we're going back to our campaign, our election laws and, and re reference, referencing that. Okay, section 7.03, uh, we dropped by ordinance twice and also the general fund. Uh, usually uh, that is done by resolution, so we just kind of clarified, figured we'll take ordinance out of there and, and it's done by resolution. <coughs> Section 7.05, submission of the budget. Uh, we just dropped the debit service after talking with staff and uh, <coughs> basically that stays the same, so. Section 7.06, uh, we changed first to second regular meeting of the month. This coincides with Lottertail County, I believe, and their procedures. So uh, just a change in what meeting date does the action on the budget should uh, conform. Section 7.12, we drop by ordinance again. And uh, this is usually done by, or by resolution. So that's the only change there. Section 10.03, uh, we do not have a public utility owned by the city, so we just drop that and add, uh, adopted by the council, the council shall hold a public, public hearing, so. Section 12.06, vacation of streets, we just add the six to its members to conform with the rest of our charter. Section 12.09, uh, remove, remove some commas. Section 12.12, .12, purchases and contracts. Uh, we change the word consort to conjunction with the city administrator. <coughs> Any questions for the charter commission, Rob? Okay. Uh, quite a few business owners ask me about, you know, they live outside the city limits. They have businesses, business or businesses, plural, in Fergus Falls. Uh, I realize it's probably a state election law issue. Is that correct, that you have to live in the city limits to vote, or is that a local? Can that be altered by local? The reason that, you know, they'll say, well, I, I pay all these taxes, you know, and stuff. Yeah, they don't live here, but I just, you know, Fergus is my home. I live just outside the city. I just wondered if the Charter Commission could just enlighten me on that, how to answer that question. For voting purposes? Yeah. Uh, you have to vote at your place of residence. Right. That's state. State, That's state, state law. Right, so it's a state, it's a state law issue. Yeah. And then that's, that makes sense. Yeah. So we have this ordinance, which will be, well, I assume we will ask the uh, city attorney to draft at our next council meeting. And then that well, will be acted on. Yeah, yeah. you can, you can. The, um, the city attorney is also uh, statutorily the uh, attorney for the Charter Commission as well. And so the Charter Commission is asking that this uh, be introduced at the <coughs> next council meeting. Uh, there's a couple different ways to amend the Charter. One way is what's being proposed is through an, amend, uh, an ordinance. Uh, and the, the Charter can be uh, amended through an ordinance that's recommended by the Charter Commission to the City Council. And if the City Council agrees with the changes, they can introduce it at the next meeting and vote on it at the meeting that follows after that. Uh, if uh, the city council does not agree with the charter uh, commission on the suggested amendments, uh, the city council can make its own suggested edits to the charter if it wishes. Uh, if the charter commission and the city council cannot agree on charter amendments, then it can be submitted to the voters for approval. But this is the most efficient uh, way to make amendments to the charter. This is the essential function of your charter commission, uh, is to review the charter from time to time. Uh, they have spent the last year reviewing it and have, uh, in my opinion, done a good job in their uh, review and ev evaluation. Uh, and I suspect that uh, they'll revisit <coughs> this issue again in a year or two and, and continue with their functions on uh, providing uh, oversight and review of the charter so that it's the best possible working document for the for the citizens. So um, from the Charter Commission's perspective, 
Uh, these are the recommended changes uh, that, and amendments that they would uh, suggest to the Charter. And if the Council agrees, it can introduce the uh, uh, ordinance at its next meeting and uh, take action at the following meeting after that. Thank you, Rolf, and thank you to the Charter Commission for all your work on this document. I know it's a lot. I know you guys have put in a lot of work. So it's very much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Barton. We'll have it on the agenda on Monday night, and if anyone has any comments at that time, they can make them. Otherwise, we can introduce that ordinance. So, so we did set up a Charter Commission meeting for tomorrow morning, but we can go ahead and cancel that. <laughs> <laughs> we feel fine. Yeah, yeah. We don't need to meet. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, next item on the agenda, our county assessor, Doug Walvotny, is here to talk to us a little bit about uh, property tax and give us an overview. We had some questions at the last <coughs> as far as the change in um, increases due to different values, and you could just enlighten us a little bit on that, Doug. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, this is a busy time of year for us. Uh, back in around Thanksgiving time, everybody received a TNT notice, which uh, basically what it does is it gives people an idea of what their tax is going to be in uh, 2019. And I think there's probably some confusion. I think that's probably the reason I'm here is that there is no consistency whatsoever in the percentage changes that you see on those truth and taxation notices. And there is a number of reasons, and, and I want to get to those. But first, I um, provided you guys with the document, or I believe, Bill, you passed it out. Yep. And basically, what's on that document, I'll, I'm not going to go into detail on it, but I, I put it together for you guys so that you can kind of understand what we do as a department, um, uh, as an assessor's department and then uh, why we do what we do. Um, and so um, I'll just touch on a few things on that, on that. Basically, our department is responsible for two things, and that's for valuation and classification of each property. There's about 64,000 parcels in Otter Tail County, so it gets to be quite a job each year. Um, so. Um, <coughs> We value each one as of uh, January 2nd of the, of the um, assessment year. Currently, we're working on our 2019 values, which is the, uh, will be the tax base for uh, 2020 tax. Um, market value, I guess that's what it is. We, uh, you know, we establish uh, market value based on, you know, everything is basically sales driven. So uh, we do follow the market. When the market increases, we're going to follow the market. When it decreases, we're going to follow the market. And those, uh, you know, we're supposed to value all of our properties within 90 to 105 percent of what they're bought and sold for. In a perfect world, we'd be there, we'd be there on every sale, but uh, it, it's not perfect. Um, but anyways, uh, and then also classification, we have over 50 classifications of property with different tax rates behind them and um, so and we, we classify all of our properties based upon their primary use uh, as I said everything is sales driven um, and we analyze the market every year um, try to get a uh, grip on what what is going on in the market what properties um, you know, are going up, what properties are going down. Um, so, and basically, um, we study sales in a one year's sales period time, and that period is from October 1st every, every year to September 30th. That's the, you know, that's the uh, sales period that the Department of Revenue um, has uh, where we, um, analyze or all the sales are put together all the good sales all the um, you know the arm's length sales and then but it's our responsibility to can I just ask you a question on break it apart I'm sorry can I ask a question then so if if when when you look at the sales values does, do you do that on a neighborhood basis or just on an individual basis we we actually look at um, 
well we look at you know we do look at neighborhoods we stratify sales um, you know and I'll focus on the residential market you have different um, you know you have different markets within a market there are certain types of houses that um, will sell better um, in 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 the market than others we experienced that this year age is taken into consideration right I'm sorry Ben. age is taken I mean you I, just working with the assessors office, I know there's a number of different like age and style of house and yeah um, yeah yeah lot size and yep yep could I follow it up you know, that yeah, question sure. so in the real estate business <clears throat> I understand having property valued I often get three comparables that aren't right necessarily in the neighborhood. And those comparables then allow there to be a certain amount of buffer. That is, let's say someone on Star Lake builds a cabin on an island, which is a true fact, you know. And therefore, someone else who has land on an island, that land goes up based on that building that was put up on that other island. That is, that all of a sudden, here's an island, and they run electrical cord under the water and you know, over the, on the ice and drop it down, and there's a new. So what happens is, what I'm looking at, and what I've, I've been into your office and talked about it, I'm wondering if you use that kind of a three comparables from a region, or if you primarily look at the property that's sold in that area, and then transfer the value to other parcels in that area that are <coughs> like that. Is that how it works? True, yes. Um, okay, sales, sales, for instance, in the city of Fergus Falls, you know, we look at, uh, we kind of, um, you know, we look at the different value of homes and, and uh, if there's a certain group that is selling better, uh, we're gonna adjust that group up you know, to get within that 90 to 105 percent, so it is affected by you know what stuff is um, sold for. Um, now you were talking about an island. Just a simple fact of building a home on an island that isn't going to spike other ones. If we have sales of properties like that, and it shows either we're high or low on, and then we're going to adjust that type of unique property. Does that make sense, Rod? Yeah, I've. I, I'm trying to make sure that I understand do, what your formula we're, is. We're different. We're different um, than a fee appraiser. A fee appraiser, they they have the luxury of finding three comparables. What we do is we we're under a mass appraisal system. We make adjustments in masses. Right, and I would think that would buffer it. But like I've seen, even our taxes this year, we have one lot that's up 60 percent. I've talked to somewhere over a hundred. So I'm wondering, do you have a new assessment, a new assessor on staff? Do you have a new policy that you've added, or are all of a sudden real estate values just spiking weirdly all over the place because it's well, there used I to be a I law you couldn't raise your taxes that, that much. It's on you know. an individual basis where we need to sit down and figure out what happened. There's a lot of different factors that go into you know that estimate of tax there's a lot of factors right, I understand Doug I was just trying to get you know how do you do it is it sort of like a black box of, you know or I mean is it is there a formula a citizen can say well this is how we know that you got that you arrived at that whether it's the Red Horse Ranch or whatever it is how did you arrive at that you know is it use and other things or because it sounds like there's a lot in your formula and the average citizen I think would like to know well, just what is it? Exactly how do you make that evaluation? Yeah. We do have schedules that we use. Uh, we have, for, uh, folks in on the residential, again, we have schedules and we have different grades on homes. We have your lower grade homes and you have your higher grade homes. And then we have a rate per square foot that's behind those grades. The lower the grade, the less per square foot, the higher, the more <clears throat> per square foot. You know, because obviously they're, um, they're going to be more um, expensive to build the more you know the higher um, grade homes are going to be more expensive to value or to build per square foot than the lower grade homes and um, we do have you know those types of schedules and then we apply depreciation based on condition and it's all um, goes back to the market of you know what the different types of um, homes are bought and sold for so was this year a kind of an adjusting year then? I mean, it's, it's just that I, I had a resident call me and their, their, their house, which was a two-bedroom house, 
went up kind of quite a bit. And they were kind of obviously concerned because they didn't sell the house and they hadn't done any improvements to the house. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, and that, so was this kind of a year of, of or was it, if houses in that neighborhood sold that were similar to theirs at a higher value, would, is that how that would be reflective in their value? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure what kind of house you're, you're talking about. It's just a two-bedroom house with a... Is it an older house or...? Yeah, probably 50s. 60s? Yeah. Um, yeah, those, uh, we did make uh, a greater change in general on, on the masses right. because of what they're bought and sold for. They, they have kind of like a almost double, double two-and-a-half stall garage and you know, separate from the house. I mean, but, it, but theirs went up quite a bit. Or, you know, from a value mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, thanks. Doug, yeah. do the, do the um, does the assessor's office visit one ward per year each? Is that accurate as well? It's going to get to that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, um, if I can go to the back of the document here, the quintile review, statutorily, we're to value, uh, we're actually to physically view a property uh, once every five years. So basically what we do is our appraisers will <coughs> break, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> break out um, each tax scene. You know, they're all assigned different jurisdictions and then they'll, they'll figure out uh, which one-fifth of the taxing jurisdiction that they're actually going to physically view. And what they do is they go out and they knock on the door and, and you know, if somebody's home, they go over the assessment. Ideally, it's best if we can get inside, have an interior view as well as the exterior. Today's world, people have the same work schedules that we do, so we find that, you know, there's a lot of people that are gone. So basically what we do then is we do our best job from the exterior. We, we walk around the house, check out all our data, make sure it's accurate, and then we go on to the next one. Each assessor is assigned about 6,000 parcels per year. So it, it is a huge task in a, in a pretty narrow window which we're able to go out and view. So, um, you know, we try to do the best job we can. We go out and, um, like I said, check out the data, make sure it's accurate, have a, have a, have a look at it for depreciation purposes. Um, you know, try to um, estimate the value the best we can based on the information that we gather. And like I said, we're the goal is to get our values 90 to 105 percent, and that's per you know per state of state um, guidelines, and that's the same guidelines throughout you know throughout the state that each county has to abide by. There is a board of equalization too for those people that exactly. feel that their their evaluation went up higher than what it should have, and we go through that once a year. So. Exactly. Uh, if, yep. if they feel that, that it went up more than it should, they can come to that Board of Equalization. And it, we will actually, if it's, a, if it's in my ward, I go with one of the assessors to that home and they let us check it out. Not always, but most often. If there's a complaint about, about uh, being too high, we have had some places where they would not let us in. And uh, you could see physically that the evaluation was where it should be. In fact, in one case, it went up even higher yet because there were things that were done to the house that, that we happens. didn't know about. Yeah, and like Jim said, every <clears throat> every spring we mail out <clears throat> value notice value notice to all of our taxpayers, and then we hold our local boards in April and May. And that's where people need to pay attention to what the classification is and what the value is. And then if they feel, you know, their property is um, overvalued, or even if they just want to find out how it is valued, that's, that's a great opportunity. Or, you know, just they can come up to our department. Everything we have, most everything we have is of public record. Um, so, and then now, of course, with the Internet, I mean, all, a lot of our information is out there. So... Um, our goal is to is to try to have everything equal. That's that's our goal. We have no reason, nothing to benefit by having somebody's value up here, or down here. Our our goal is to try to equalize things out. Your Honor. 
Yeah, go ahead. Just question. Clarification on, you said that it's property is based on primary use. Those are your words, primary use. Right. Is that the primary use that the owner is using it for or the potential use of that property? It's, it's how the property is used by, by the owner. Mm -hmm. Okay, but let's say you have an older retired person living in an area and on each side property sells for 50% more than it has been, all right? Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that that person is not changing their use of the property at all, they're just living there, but the people on each side built very nice homes. Mm -hmm. So isn't it true that you're evaluating it based on those neighbors, not the use that they, they haven't changed their use, they're just living in an older house and they're on a fixed income. Isn't it true that it's actually being valued based on what is sold, not the use that the owner is actually, they haven't changed it one whit, but they have to pay higher taxes because your formula says that they do. Isn't that true? <clears throat> well, I think you're bringing classification and value together. Classification I'm just bringing the practical reality of the homeowner, what they get with the but, taxes. But he's saying okay. the classification, classification doesn't change the value. Classification is a separate so issue. Not classification, classification is Right, but it is based on use. use. Right. Cla okay, let me give an example of what a classification would be. It would be Resident, your residential homes, if, you, if it's your primary residence, you own an occupied permit, that's what we call a residential homestead. If you rent it out, it's residential non-homestead. It's, and then we have also, you go outside here, we have commercial property. There's a commercial classification. There's an apartment classification. There's over I understand 50. that, yeah. Okay. But in the, back to the, the let island let example. Let him finish. Okay. He's yeah. trying to answer your question. Yeah. It's okay. I'll I'll talk to the assessor's and, office. And the and island, we'll unless out. we're going to build on Lake Alice Island, let's keep yeah, it yeah, to yeah, that yeah. city. Right. Yeah. No, that's true. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. But I, I think it, yeah, getting, we're all good here. Well, from what I gathered, you're getting value and cla and and uh, classification kind of intertwined in that example. But um, I would like to I'd like to move on here quick. I know Bill absolutely. Told me we have a busy agenda. So we'll yeah, move right. on. Passes. Already exceeded that. But <laughs> possible reasons possible reasons for. TMT um, notices to show the different uh, percentages on there. One would be like we've been talking about classification change. Um, there's tax rates behind the classifications. So if somebody loses their homestead on a property and goes non homestead, um, that's a classification issue. If something goes from residential to commercial as far as classification, that's classification. And that does affect the tax in the end. Um, other things, new construction, stuff that's under construction that uh, we now uh, have completed, or uh, omitted value. Um, and that happens where our appraisers out, are out looking at property and we find something that was not on the assessment before, we have to add that on the, as part of the value. So any new value that's added to an assessment, um, that's going to increase that um, that property more percentage-wise than, than the average. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, estimated market value changes due to, due to our quintile viewing. Um, I think that goes with, um, there's not much I can add to that. Uh, and then also, I think I've already hit on the fact too that, uh, you know, market value and mass, you know, and when we when we dig into a market and we find that there's certain types of homes <coughs> that are selling better than other types of homes, uh, we can have a stronger adjustment on those than average. So um, that's going to cause those types of homes to have more of a tax increase than you know than the average. Um, these are just a few things that. Uh, can cause differences in TNT notices when you're comparing with your neighbor. So hopefully I've explained it somewhat. Absolutely, Doug. Thank you very much for being here. And I think the bottom line is that your office is, is open. Absolutely. You're around for people yep. to call with questions and, yep. and there's a process to go through. Yep. So if people have questions, they can right. call the county assessor's office. Yep. 
I have my answer. So, thank you very much, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next item on the agenda is a pollinator-friendly city proclamation that is uh, being brought forth by the mayor, the Natural Resource Advisory Committee. I know Rod serves on that committee. Karen is the chair. I'm going to call on Karen Terry to introduce this item. I know we have some members of the in the audience here that are also. I'm assuming that's what they're here for. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Wild guess. Good morning, Mr. Council. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time this morning to listen to um, our proposal, our, our request this morning. And Mark Sundberg is going to present that. He has come and talked to the Natural Resource Advisory Committee a couple times, and we've had a discussion about this. Um, Guy is part of that, as is Rod. So I'm happy to bring this to you this morning. Thank you. Welcome, Mark. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I uh, first introduced this idea of a uh, pollinator-friendly city designation to the your committee late this summer. Um, it's something that that's popping up around Minnesota. There are, I think, currently about 26 cities that has this designation, and we would be the first city, uh, kind of in outstate Minnesota, to get the designation. And I think it would be really good for us to do this. Um, but before I get into what it is and what it means, um, a little bit about why. What, why, you know, why, why is it important? Well, I don't know, you've probably heard in the news lately or you've seen, it's hard to, it's hard to miss it. We, pollinators are in decline worldwide. Um, we, we are seeing uh, in our, I'm a, I'm a commercial beekeeper, in case some of you don't know who I am, and, and, and uh, we run our business uh, just outside of Fergus Falls here, and we've done it for, I'm a fourth generation beekeeper, and we've done it for many, many years here. And we are seeing losses in our operation in the last year, I think we had some bees, some, some areas out in California, we lost nearly 50% of what we sent out there. And it's getting worse every year, and that's up from, from uh, when my grandfather was doing it, it would be maybe 10% uh, over, the, over the winter and things like it was just, it's nothing, but it's changed dramatically. And it's not just honeybees too, it's, it's native bees. We're, we're, uh, we have about 400 species of native bees in Minnesota, and we're seeing a dramatic decline in all that. Uh, and it's, you know, butterflies to all this stuff. So we got all, all kinds of different pollinators. We got bees, we got butterflies, bats, birds, and other insects, and they all combine, and they all need to do the job of pollination, which is really their most important. I mean, we think about honeybees producing honey, but really that's a kind of a minor thing. Their, their, their main job is really to make the food, the good food that we eat, that we really like to eat. And about a third of the food we eat every day is dependent on pollinators of some sort, not just wind pollination. Now, these are creatures like bees and insects and things like that. So. Uh, things like almonds and apples and cranberries, uh, those are really big, strawberries, sunflowers, and like tomatoes, you know, maybe don't think of that, but some of, every plant has kind of a specific pollinator. The tomatoes are really an interesting one. Um, tomatoes need vibration to, in order for the, po the pollen is really stuck up in there. So if you, have, if you don't have bumblebees, bumblebees are well suited for this. They can get up and they can vibrate that with their low wings and they can knock that pollen loose. So there's, it's really important to have all these different pollinators. So what's caused the, the decline ever since World War II, I think we had about 4.5 million uh, colonies of honeybees in the United States and we've dropped down to about 2 million now. And it's, it's hard to maintain that every year. We need about a million and a half of them every year just to pollinate almonds in California. So we're kind of in a, in a crisis with pollination. Um, but all of that, why did all that change? Uh, well, after World War II, kind of our farming, some of our farming methods changed quite a bit. We became a little bit more monoculture. Um, we went away from using our diverse farms. We went away from using cover crops. That was a big deal. Cover crops, the clover and the alfalfa, really good forage for all of our pollinators. We don't see as much of that on the landscape anymore. Uh, and we also started using a lot of herbicides uh, to kill all the weeds, and the weeds are basically the food for all the insects. So, so your basic insect needs uh, pollen for protein, and they need nectar for carbohydrates, and those all come out of the 
all come out of the plants that we're, we don't see as much of. And we've just started using more pesticides, um, and we've, we've also seen in our beehives a lot of different pests that get in there, and it's all these things have combined, and that's what's happening. Our numbers are decreasing. But what we can do is uh, make note of this, like what we're seeing a lot of attention uh, about pollinators, and that's what this pollinator-friendly city thing, city thing would do. Um, we can pass a, a resume. We have a great draft here right now that I believe uh, our, our mayor has written up and signed. Uh, correct? I that this morning. All right. This, yeah, <laughs> excellent. All right. This is a great start. I think we need to uh, ultimately come up with a, an ordinance, uh, and that will help us to come up with a, a kind of more of a plan of, of promoting, like, what are, what are we going to do with our parkland and how we manage that and how we manage um, you know, even right down to some of our residents' lawns and, and things like that. So uh, let's see. We, uh, we have a precedent already. Uh, we, I think we have what's called a green city plan. Is that correct? I don't know Green much steps, about. and we also monarch, uh, monarch and, and we're a monarch-friendly monarch city, yeah, monarch so this monarch this falls right in line with that. Uh, it kind of highlights what we're already doing. I think in, in Noise Park, we've done some good things out there uh, with that. And uh, let's see, uh, we would be. Mark, a question for you. Yeah. You mentioned that there's 26 cities all in the metropolitan area. Yeah. Is this is this like a certain desert, like monarch friendly? Is there a designation that we can achieve by by going down this road that's, that yes. makes it a statement that we? Yes. Yes. And that's that's what. And yes, that's what it is. You know, it's it's basically just a designation. Is all it is. Sure. Uh, we we can't do as far in terms of. Uh, passing laws to restrict pesticides and things like that. We can't do anything uh, that the state, we can't do anything more than what the state mandates. So the state, if we, so for example, uh, if we want to ban Roundup, we can't do that because the state doesn't do that. If we say we can't, we, so we can't say as a city we're going to ban Roundup. We can say with this, with this, we can say we're not going to use it and we're going to suggest that we minimize it and we be careful with some of these chemicals. That's what we're going to do. And another thing, another, another component of it is the uh, education aspect of it, the promotion. Every year there's, uh, as a city, if we do this, we'll promote, uh, I think there's a, uh, a week in June, pollinator, pollinator week. So, uh, But I don't know, any other, any, any questions about I, I what, know, what it might mean? It's been brought up. How does the mosquito spray, we're going to end up, because the council will have to address that at some point, probably this winter, because there's been some people asking about killing mosquitoes in town. I personally right. don't necessarily agree with an overall city approach to that. I think it's a personal deal. However, how does that spring, if it were to become a deal? Right. Well, you know, if, if, the bees? if we were a pollinator-friendly city, I can speak from behalf of a beekeeper, I can tell you that there are no mosquito sprays that are bee-friendly. They're all deadly to all beneficials. So. Having this declaration, it gives you as a council, uh, you can you can hold this up and say, well, that's kind of off the table because we're a pollinator friendly city. We don't. That's not. It, it makes the decision easier because you've decided to to look for alternative ways to deal with mosquitoes. That's other questions, comments. Thanks, Guy or Rod. You guys are on the committee. Do you guys have any any comments? I can just say I talked with quite a few of the other cities that have adopted a pollinator-friendly um, commitment, and they are just going about it as a, a suggestion to their residents. They're not going the way of an ordinance at this point, so not regulating, um, not um, restricting use, but uh, like Mark said, Leading by state, example. Right. Leading yeah. by example and suggesting mm -hmm. right. this is the first step. Like there's so many things that we're doing in this community, whether it's with the monarchs, with the prairie wetlands, and this is another natural step for us to be. Uh, right. Is that accurate? I mean, yes. we could lead by example, I think, is a, is a good way to do it. You know, another example is in the spring when, with, uh, I know everybody, you didn't have a love-hate relationship with dandelions. I love them because I think they're, they're essential. They're like well, the most important early source of nectar. But this could give our, our our park and rec or whoever enforces the lawn mowing a little more lenience where 
we can let those dandelions come up and grow a little bit and let them do their thing before we before we send out the notice that you must mow you know it's it's and just uh, just identifying things like this like it's okay to have a piece of your lawn get a little higher if there's blooming stuff or things for pollinators in it that's also a really important thing that we that uh, we need to look at as as a city we should and and we can take portions of our parks and say well this is a this is this is for native plants, or this is for even for non-native plants, for honeybees or something. We can let some of the uh, clovers grow up here, and it's good for them. Even even in places like uh, I was thinking, like Broken Down Dam, where it's kind of a rough wild park, or out at the dump, where we just let some of the some of the sweet clover grows up, we leave it there because it's beneficial. It doesn't maybe it doesn't look good, but we 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 try to educate people as to the value of it. This is this stuff. Is really doing good. It's not an evil weed. Thank you, Mark. I think that yep. education piece is so so important. Um, Great. And, uh, and thank you to the Natural Resources Advisory Committee too for the work that they're doing and the, the expertise and the knowledge that they're bringing. So, do we have a recommendation to bring this uh, for discussion to the council on Monday night? I'll offer that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I'll you. second, Your Honor. Thank you, Justin. All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Both same sign that motion. Thank, thank you. you, Mark. Thank you, Karen. Next item on the agenda is council procedure pertaining to January 7th, the first uh, meeting of the year. I'll call on our city administrator, Andrew Bremson. Yeah, good morning, Your Honor. Members, try to make up time here on the next five items or so. Um, staff is looking for guidance this morning and, and at the council meeting on Monday as to how we want to handle the incoming, outgoing council uh, turnover. Historically, the outgoing council has done their business at the January meeting and then we've switched seats at the end of the meeting. Two years ago we changed that and the incoming council was seated immediately at the beginning of that meeting. And so for the purposes of creating the agenda we're looking for clarity on how the council wants to proceed and also so the incoming or outgoing members know you know what they're going to be responsible for preparing for. So just looking for guidance on that and uh, it's fairly straightforward. I mean, what we did two years ago, we, we got, we recognized um, the old council, any business that needed to be taken by that council, and then we got people sworn in and got actually, work. Actually, two years ago, we went right into the new council doing it. I, I personally feel we should let the old council take care of the old business. The new council comes in, takes care of the new business. That's my suggestion. That's I was the one that introduced that, and so I'll take responsibility for it. And I had talked to our attorney about it. I don't know what our attorney is. I think this is an attorney question. But as I understand Minnesota statute, it says that the new council shall take their seats or be seated or be sworn in at the first meeting of the new year. And in general, that's the statute. Now, I don't feel comfortable. I will not be doing any business as a council member in the new year because I wasn't elected to serve in that year and that's why I, ins I asked for it to change I believe I've talked to other cities I believe we're an anomaly I've other cities councils do not do this they let the new ones come in and they start them out in the first meeting so that's that's my understanding and why I introduced it two years ago and I, I tend to agree with that just let's uh, anything that needs to be taken care of uh, and I apologize for the confusion it caused. However, I had raised the issue two years before that. It wasn't acted on. So then two years, I mean, you know, at the first, you know, at the first seating. And so I just think we should be in line with what's normative. And I, I think we're, we're an anomaly. So. Your Honor, I also mentioned, too, we don't have a committee of the whole meeting leading up to that meeting because of the holiday schedule. So um, to your point, Mr. Fish, I'm not sure that that's an issue because we won't have started conversations and then passed them on to that to that meeting so yeah, yeah. I, I would also say that you know we've just kind of gone through the charter commission the charter, charter obviously is elected members of the council shall assume their dates after being qualified and sworn in at the first <coughs> regular meeting of the council in january so i think we're seeing it's the first meeting in january and we always have done that it's just a matter of at what point during that meeting so that's just clarifying at what point so i think it um, if there's anything i mean the old council will, will hopefully will be here and be recognized we'll change it over and we'll go about the business right that's what, that's what we did two years ago i think that uh, we should do Is that yeah that's that would be my comment was to wrap up our business in oh, december and then plan on the new council doing business in january good enough all right. Let's take a motion to. Uh, I make a motion that we uh, 
the, the new council is yeah, seated immediately. The, the old council is recognized and the new council is, is yeah. recognize them. Recognize the old council members and sign a die. Like awesome. that word. Um, I do, although we do need a quorum for that first meeting to start the meeting. So keep yeah. that in the back of your mind is you, we need five people to be here. I'll second that. <coughs> have a motion and second. Aye. Welcome, Scott. <laughs> All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Both aye. same sign that motion. Carried. Next, we'll call on Lynn Olson to uh, talk to us about <laughs> polling places. Hi. Um, so what we have to do every year by state law is designate polling places for the following year. We're not anticipating any elections happening in 2019, but in the event there is a special election, the school has something, we need to be prepared. And we have a good problem that we're growing. Minnesota had set a record for the, um, the election back in November with 64% voting. We were actually closer to 76% in the city. So we have very good voter turnout which is great, but it also means that we have outgrown some of our spaces. So what I'm asking you for today is to designate some new polling places. I figure I have 10 elections before I retire and I wanna find permanent places for these <laughs> elections to take place. So what we're recommending is Ward 1. Um, right now it's at the fire hall and it's a bit snug. And we have that beautiful new library community space and we'd like to use that library room instead for Ward 1. Ward 2, um, the National Guard Armory is a huge building. However, it's staffed differently. There is no local staffing anymore. And getting someone to drive over from Moorhead at six o'clock in the morning to make sure the, the building's open and to be there and lock it up at 10 o'clock at night, it's a little scary. So what we're trying to do is um, move that to the YMCA community room. Ward 3, we're gonna stay with the Legacy Hall at M State. And Ward 4, um, we've been using the Hillcrest Gym. At the primary, we've been using the upper level in the lobby. At the same time, the students are using it. It hasn't been working great, um, but for a primary, it, it has, as was working. We moved to the gym floor for the general election. Um, using a gym at a school, we take away their space for two days. And they've been kind, kind enough to let us use that space, but giving us some pretty good hints, like um, <laughs> if you want to find a new spot, that would be great. <laughs> um, and also technology-wise, with all the, the new technology we have, the pull pads, finding um, plugins on a gym floor is nearly impossible. So the Bigwood Center is actually in Ward 3. But after talking to Wayne and talking to the Secretary of State, it is allowable and it is nice to have a city facility that will be there for the long, for those 20 years until I retire and then you can go wherever you want. <laughs> um, but to have that, that Bigwood Center be used as a nice community space and they're very excited about having 1,500 to 2,000 people walk into their doors and see that what they have to offer as well. So, um, again, asking for two things is to, to designate these new polling places and then to also at the same time adopt a resolution that we can combine Ward 2, Precincts 2, and Precincts 3. So Precincts 3 is Woodland Heights only. So we right now have our own precinct, we have our own head judge, we have our own five judges working. Um, it's kind of silly for 100 voters that come in that day. So by combining these precincts that we can make more efficient use of people's time, um, and the, uh, the cost that it t takes for an election. So again, the recommendation for the polling places and for the combining of precincts is what we're asking for today. Any questions? Any questions before I try to type that all out? Um, <laughs> first of all, thank you for what you do. I appreciate it. And, um, and, and I, like, I like the ideas. My one, uh, one concern I could see with the Bigwood Center would be accessibility is are we gonna cause you know any undue transportation hardships for people that no we um, guy and I have talked about that a little bit and what we thought we could do is just add some additional um, handicap spots that day mm -hmm. they're out in in the front part, portion of the building mm -hmm. um, it's probably not much further to walk than it has been for the Hillcrest gym location there is quite a, a walk there even at the armory there's there's quite a distance for people to walk over there so yeah. I'm thinking accessibility wise, they're gonna put us in a room, we're not gonna be in the lobby, so we'll have a, a nice closed space that they can still have other functions going on at the same time. Okay. Other questions, Rod? 
Uh, yeah, that was my question on parking too. If other functions are going on, um, I've been there when it's kind of full, so I'm just wondering how yep. that would. And they've uh, they're they are so excited about hosting us that they're going to do their best to make sure that we're their number one. I mean, when they realize the number of people that are coming in, they're going to try their best. You know, on a Tuesday, it's not likely they're going to have a lot of people for for an event. It's not like a wedding going on at the same time. So, um, they're very open to to working with us and making sure we have adequate space. And then, uh, just as far as statutory law, uh, the polling place does not have to be within the precinct? Yeah. Or, I mean, within the ward? That is. No, well, uh, we, we did t talk to the Secretary of State, and we talked to the county auditor and checked that out. And as long as there is, it's the accessibility, it has to be an accessible space that still is within the city limits. Oh. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Make those recommendations to the council. Thank you, Jim. Second, thank you, Thank you, Tom. Thank Any you. other discussion? No. All in favor of that motion, say aye. Aye. Same sign that motion carries. Thank you, Lynn. Next, we'll call on our city engineer, Brian Yuvaro, to talk about a trail permit renewal. Good yes. Morning, Brian. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor, members of the council. This is a pretty procedural before you right now. Uh, back in 2009, MnDOT granted the city a limited use permit to construct and maintain a pedestrian trail along. Truck Highway 210, uh, we're generally located at 210 uh, from, highway, from Pebble Lake Road to the Central Lakes Trail. At this time, it, uh, this permit needs to be renewed. We have reviewed it. We made a few edits and corrections with the exhibit. That's also included in uh, your packet right now. So at this time, I'm just requesting the City Council pass a resolution um, extending this permit with MnDOT. Questions? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Brent. I'll second, yeah. All in favor of recommending that to the council, say aye. Aye. Always same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next, I'll call on City Administrator Andrew Bremseth uh, to give us a discussion on the business development of Fergus Falls Agreement. Thank you, Your Honor. Members, uh, this is also a pretty straightforward item. The, the agreement that we have in place with business development of Fergus Falls expires at the end of the year. As you recall, we did a one-year agreement last year. I'm just looking to extend the exact agreement until March 31st, which buys us a few months of time to make the changes that have been discussed at several meetings and that have been recommended. Um, and I apologize for making this item more confusing than necessary in the packet. Originally, there was going to be another component to it, but this is all that's required to accomplish what we're setting out to do. And and uh, terms are the same. It's just simply extending the agreement for three months to allow us to finish the work that we need to do. I'll make that a recommendation, Your Honor. Thank you, Anthony. I'll suck, Your Honor. Thank you, Justin. Any dis further discussion? All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Same sign that motion carries. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we'll call on April <coughs> Zumach to give us a uh, discussion about the developer's agreement extension related to properties. Thank you, April. Good morning, Your Honor and Council members. Um, if you remember, last year, or in 2017, um, the city acquired three properties and we went out on RFP. The, both developers are asking for an extension. Um, 315 East Vaso was a rehab. They had some health issues in your packet. He has a letter written to the council requesting what has happened for his hardship for the extension. And then uh, with Central Community Action, due to the nature of the lots, they were just struggling to get a three bedroom, um, one bath, something that was sellable and trying to get these lots pre-sold before they developed them. So they're at, both parties are asking for a July 31st, 2019 extension for the development of those lots. And that's a recommendation from staff to approve those recommendations. Correct. Any questions for, for April? I'll offer that. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I'll second. Thank you, <clears throat> Scott. All in favor of that motion, say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Uh, April, you're up again with the metal recycling uh, revocation. Um, this is in reference to TNL Crushing's license. I am requesting that uh, the council makes a resolution to revoke the license for this property. Um, the owner of the property is not truly operating as a metal recycler. Also, we're dealing with some public nuisance items. Um, so they're kind of in between a junk dealer and a metal recycler. Um, and we've tried to work with them to get a plan and, and we have not received that. So I am asking that we revoke that license and not so that would be a uh, recommendation, recommendation to the council, and of course, then that uh, property owner would have the opportunity on Monday night to address the council. Uh, in, you know, I'll offer your honor. Thank, thank you, Scott. And I'll just 
just reference this property if nobody's familiar with it on Vernon Avenue where Burger King is there's a property located right behind the Burger King that's wondering about that I was gonna ask um, about that. that has semis and is is kind of looks like a junkyard it's a mess. We dealt with this property it's been an ongoing issue years yes. too, right so any questions just as far as the zoning I mean the revoking it's is it operating in wrongly in a wrongly zone it's the correct zone but he has to either operate within his metal, metal recyclist license or provide his plans for a junk dealer's license and he has not done that he has not gotten that from the city those other licenses that he would need or no no nope. and we've had various meetings with him um, provided him the ordinances and what he needs to provide to be in compliance I just ask our attorney about that if he if he bought the ordinance if he bought the licenses is that or is it just is it this is the first step to revoke I mean, is that he doesn't have any recourse on that, or? Well, his recourse, the council can revoke a license if it's not being uh, the, the, the activity on the property doesn't conform to what the license. Uh, He's been given warnings, or, or what? Um, back in 2014, the license was suspended, oh. and he has been. We have been working with him about a year and a half, almost two years, to try to get him into compliance. No, yeah. thank you. This has been going on for. Probably more than since two a year and a half. It's been going on a long time, and I've been com communication with him. I said just clean it up and get it right, and we'll have no problem. But he's him in April. Uh, doesn't work out. So if you if you if you drive by there, you would see why. Just, yeah, go take a look at it. Yeah, yeah. I've seen, I just want to make sure we, the process that we follow is one we follow for everybody. And it's, uh, <coughs> April has done everything she can to make, it, make him comply, and, and it's. Yeah, we'll certainly recognize him on Monday night if you'd like to make his case before the council before we vote on the actual revocation. So, uh, any other questions on this motion to recommend this to the council? We get uh, a summary of the kind of. I mean, would April provide a summary of kind of the things that we've done just so just so they line. are that yep yeah, so they are outlined for you know. I can have Lynn send that on, um, just due to the size of this packet this time around. No, I mean, I just, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> kind of. Literally, literally, as you say, just to sort of like, almost like, as you say, July, July 19, yes, 4, I sure you know, 2014, that. and just so that, I mean, it's out there for everybody to see that, you know, as you say, we've, we've done all we can to assist. Sure. All right, we can do that. All in favor of that motion to recommend that to the council say uh, aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. We didn't quite make the 8 o'clock cutoff, but I think we'll can still wrap it up, right, Ryan? Um, so next item on the agenda is the unique crop opportunities update and discussion, and we'll call on our city planner, Ryan Vitlock. Thank you very much, Your Honor, and uh, members of the council. Uh, good morning. Um, I just wanted to provide uh, you guys a quick uh, update of kind of what's going on uh, with uh, both the plat and the variants for uh, unique opportunities, legacy apartments on Tower Road. Um, first off, I'm going to kind of walk really quick through what has happened over the last two months because there's been kind of a lot that's went on. So um, on October 8th, uh, both the variants and the plat uh, were recommended by approval by their respective bodies. Um, both of those items came to you guys on October 15th and they were uh, both uh, tabled by uh, the council. Uh, the applicant agreed to extend uh, the 60-day deadline on the variance to December 28th. Uh, the plat also expires on December 28th as its preliminary plat has 120 days to be acted upon. Um, on October 29th, uh, a Joint Council and Planning Commission meeting, uh, both items uh, were directed to go back to their respective bodies by the council, and the council also <coughs> this development task force to kind of discuss uh, policies and procedures and all of that. Uh, November 13th, um, the Planning Commission decided to table their reconsideration of the plat. Uh, they wanted to have a, a meeting of the development task force first before they, they tackled it again. Um, and the Board of Zoning did not have a quorum. Um, so uh, that item was not able to be acted upon. So fast forward to uh, Monday night. Um, so both of these items went back to um, their bodies. The Board of Zoning uh, agreed unanimously to uphold their recommendation to approve the variance. And that variance, if, uh, to remind everybody, is uh, a setback variance along Tower Road. A portion of the building encroaches about 10 feet, um, and then the remainder of the building encroaches about 2 to 2 and a half feet within the required 35-foot front setback of, of the property. So it is still on the property, it's just within that required front setback. 
Um, the Planning Commission uh, rescinded their recommendation for approval um, and made actually what I would call a recommendation of no recommendation. And the reason for that was that they stated that they wanted to go on the record of their opposition um, to the variance, uh, their opposition to um, the reconsideration um, of the TIF, and also that they wanted to state that there is a, a small portion of, of um, the Glacial Edge Trail uh, right of way that is actually on this property and as part of this plat they would be um, that would be a, an easement that would be granted to the city and they want to just make very clear that even though there would be an easement on the property that that would not be holding the um, property owner any type of future um, benefits or anything from the city um, so basically uh, you know, that's kind of where we're at. These items will be before you on, on um, Monday night. I do want to make clear that um, these items do need to be acted upon in one way or the other because we are basically out of time. Uh, this is the last council meeting of the year. Both of these items uh, will expire on December 28th. In my conversations I've had with the applicant, they do not appear to be willing to sign an additional extension. Um, the other thing I will mention is that this preliminary plat is not necessarily needed. Um, they have a legal existing lot um, that is exempt from having to be platted uh, due to its size. Um, the reason why it is being platted is A, for that trail easement, and B, um, to separate the existing apartment from the remainder of the site, which uh, is would be as part of that uh, redoing of the TIF and all of that, just to put on just that one lot. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, and I will be here on Monday night to present as well. But uh, just want to give you guys an update and an opportunity to have a quick discussion on this. Sure. And thank you for that, Ryan. And I'm sure there might be some questions from the, from the committee. Can just I, to, can just I add just a few things before we Sure. I was just going to clarify something, but, but uh, we'll go ahead. I, I was just going to mention the, the reason that we had this on the agenda today is because if the council is leaning towards denying either the variance or the plat, we need to do so with our reasons for denial in writing. So I wanted to have a, an understanding of, of where the conversation was gonna go at the council meeting on Monday night. Also, the representative of the development group was able to be here today, and I see that he's here, but was unable to be here on Monday, so it would be a good opportunity to hear from him if, if you wanna do that. And then finally, um, you know, Ryan mentioned the deadline of December 28th for the plat and the variance. The development agreement, which is where the TIF conversation lies, does not have the same deadline, and there's no urgency to act on that necessarily. It should be kind of the final item, so to speak, because to be compliant with that development agreement, they're going to have to get this variance um, and be in compliance with all of our zoning code and building code of the city. So um, that one is not on the agenda necessarily for Monday. We can add that to the agenda if the council wants to discuss it at the same time, but there is not a deadline or, or a real <coughs> sense of urgency to resolve that issue um, because the first payment wouldn't be set to be made until sometime in 2019. Bill, I'm looking at you right. halfway through the year maybe? Correct. So th just keep those things in mind as we're having this discussion today. Thank you, Andrew. And just to clarify, um, you know, we've talked a lot about procedure and process, and, and, and I think it's important while we respect everyone's um, passion for this and have strong opinions, the, the zoning board is, is charged with taking up the issue of the variance and they've made a recommendation to the council and I believe we should act on that or act on the recommendation whether we agree with them or not. The planning commission is charged with taking up the issue of the plat and whether or not that plat should be approved. And I think that, just to clarify, with all due respect to, to, to everyone involved, um, that is what the, the process uh, lays out for them so for them you know the discussion of the TIF the discussion of the variance and discussion of the plat all being together it is a project and it's easy to, to bring that together but I think we need to decompartmentalize those and take them up um, for, for for a number of reasons and I think on Monday maybe our city attorney can address that as well um, whether yeah so anyway that's that would just you know make sure that we follow the process that we've laid out and, and expect um, expect those committees and boards to uh, to adhere to as well so that's just um, my two cents with all due respect to all the committees who really have been involved in this process so any discussion are uh, on this today are we ready to bring this Monday night are we does people feel like they have the information that they need to make decisions and have discussion on Monday night bring it on Monday night, bring it on Monday night. everyone okay with that and uh, 
Charles, if there's anything um, that you'd like to, you're not going to be able to be here Monday night, but if there's anything you'd like to, um, information you'd like to get to the council, uh, we'll make sure that we can get that to them. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions, but I don't believe I have anything new to Certainly. say um, at this time. Thank you. All right. We'll bring that on Monday night. And is there anything else to come before the committee? Well, I, I would just ask the question, you know, like I mentioned, that the TIF or the development agreement piece was not proposed to be on the agenda for Monday night because we have to resolve these other issues and they're on a timeline. Do you guys want that topic to be on the agenda on Monday night and have that discussion at that time as well? What is the wishes of the council? Put it on after, obviously. I mean, I think as long as the order is Sequence. correct, we can always table it if it's not. So if you put it on there for the, so that the public knows that that is going to be an item of discussion. And if we don't take it up, then we don't take it up. Yep. Fair enough? Yep. Yes, Jim. Are we going to be looking that, at that as three different items then? Yes. Okay. Great. Yep. That's the way we should look at it, I think. We're all good? Yep. All right. We're adjourned.